Last week, we ended in verse 1 of chapter 2 because it kind of uh, was a part of verses 10 and 11 of the chapter. We spent a great detail last week talking about the backdrop, the day in which Hosea was prophesying. And we gave a lot of attention to the people of the northern kingdom, Israel, and their sin. We looked at the very start of this. And then we've seen that throughout their history, up into the days of Hosea the prophet, that they continued in their rebellion and their sin. And ultimately, it would end with the Lord's judgment and the people being taken captive by the Assyrian Empire. And so with that, we have before us here just a couple of things that the Lord did, as we can recap, in chapter 1 through the prophet Hosea. The Bible says in verse 2 that it was the word of the Lord that came to Hosea. And Hosea was given not only a command, but he was also given a message. Jot that down. Hosea was given both a command and a message. We looked at the command. And the command was to go and act out and live out, if you will. Let me say that better. Live out the message that you're going to preach. Now remember that Hosea's life and ministry will be a similitude to Israel's marriage to God. And so what the Lord commanded Isaiah, uh, Hosea to do was a very difficult task. And we looked at how God's prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, just to name a few, had some difficult tasks before them. But yet God was with them all the while. And God used these callings, if you will, to relay a message to his people. And all of this, guys, because you would say, why does God go through great lengths to get his people's attention? Two reasons. Reason number one, because God loves his people. Reason number two, because God's people are hard-headed. Can I get a witness? Okay, good. So this is, this is what we're dealing with right here. The Lord is not going to give up on his people. And I think sometimes when we kind of consider the start of this book of Hosea, it's an amazing thing to understand his amazing love. And remember, this is kind of the title of the whole book of Hosea. So in a sense, you can title Hosea, even though his name means salvation, Hosea is the prophet of love. And he reveals to us by living out this command that God gave him in verse 2, a very difficult command, that he would also feel the pains. So it doesn't mean that God feels the pain like man feels pain, but this is a similitude for us to understand what God is relating to his people, and it's found in Hosea living out this command. The command we know, we looked in great detail was that Hosea would marry a woman by the name of Gomer and that Gomer would begin to practice harlotry, live as a prostitute, receive goods from her lovers, and then Hosea would have to take her back as his wife after she had been given to other men. And then their children, starting with their son, then their daughter, and their last born son. Their names would also depict, it would be a similitude also, as to the state in which the people of Israel were in. But also, it would also reveal what God was doing among his people. Now remember the names in verse 4. And in verse 6 and in verse 9 of these children. The first name was Jezreel, which means God scatters. And God would ultimately scatter his people through the Assyrian captivity. Remember that? And then the other child's name, Lo-Urama, would mean no mercy or no love. Meaning that God's love and mercy would be lifted. Now some have a hard time wrestling with that. 
because they say, how could God be a God who loves unconditionally? And yet it says here that there will be no mercy, no love. It's not a contradiction of scripture. It's a misunderstanding on our part. Just like God's people misunderstood and forsook his love. Need I remind you that the expression of God's love is unconditional, but our enjoyment of that love is conditional. It depends on our faith and our obedience. On God's part, it's unconditional. On our part, it is conditional. We can put ourselves in a place where we are no longer under what we would call this spigot of grace, so to speak. We, we come out of, in other words, our sin, the consequences of our sin need to be judged. And we think that it's coming from an unloving God, but actually his judgment and correction is coming from a God that is full of love and full of grace and full of mercy and his and his judgment and correction and chastisement clearly shows, as Hebrew 12 says, our legitimacy or Israel's legitimacy. Because the Bible is very clear that those who are not chastened show that they are illegitimate children. They're not legitimate children. And so the picture, I think, is pretty interesting here. Israel will learn a very valuable lesson. What leads to this? I think what leads to this learning of the lesson is the frame of mind of Israel as a whole. To, in one point, think, under the leadership of Jeroboam I, the first king of the northern kingdom that we read about in 1 Kings chapter 12, starting in verse 25, is that he thought within his heart that it was okay to worship other gods. He thought that by perhaps creating this idolatry in the land of the northern kingdom to a degree that this would help his fears and insecurities. Now remember, guys, that to truly walk in the favor and the blessings of the Lord is also contingent upon our willingness to completely trust in the Lord even when we are fearful. And God works mightily when we rest in his promises and we just turn things over to him and say, you know, Lord, I don't understand what's going on. And, and fear grips my heart, but I know that you're in control. And, and all this sounds good, but this would be a sermon to preach to Israel, I guess, in this day. But they needed to go through this in order to understand and to appreciate God's love for them. And so we see that in chapter 1, in the first nine verses, really, the Lord is kind of giving the condition of God in Israel. Israel being the wife of God is kind of the picture here. And then we see here that, you know, the days that Hosea was living in, this would not be a popular message. But it was a needful message. So now when we look at chapter 2 and verse 1, verse 1 is still kind of coupled with chapter 1 in verses 10 and 11. But remember that after we see that the Lord kind of laid out Israel's history, the northern kingdom. When I say Israel, remember the northern kingdom. It's not the 12 tribes of Israel. It's only 10 tribes. 12 tribes no longer exist. Israel as it once was a nation, no longer existed as it did in the days of David and Solomon. The kingdom had been divided. But the northern kingdom itself, its condition, its condition not only that day, but its condition throughout its existence, I guess, is what we can say. And then in verse 10, it uses the word yet. The number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people. There it shall be said to them, you are sons of the living God. Then the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together and appoint for themselves one head. In other words, together, no longer divided. And they shall come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. 
Say to your brethren, my people, and to your sisters, mercy is shown. Now, remember verses 10 and 11, after you looked at nine difficult verses, like, wow, God's about to just judge, correct? God is going to judge their idolatry. He's going to judge their sin. Remember what we said, and I've always said this throughout teaching, especially in the Old Testament, is that you can choose your sin, but you cannot choose the consequences of your sin. And God will forgive you of your sin. There's no doubt about that. I mean, this is what the scriptures teach, that, that he forgives sin. And this is what's so amazing, that we serve the one who's able to forgive us of our sins, but your consequences to your sin will still be there. And those are the things that you will bear, not because God is judging you, he's forgiven you. But the consequences of your sin, this is why you have to weigh in the balance. Is this sin really worth practicing and living out? Because this could potentially take place as a result of this. No sin is good. Let me say that again. No sin is good at all. Nothing good will come out of it. So sometimes some people in their own mind, I've met people this way, well, you know what, I know nothing good is going to come out of this, but, you know, I, I, I got to do this. I want to do this. Okay. You can't force someone to stop, right? All you can do is pray for them and, and hope that they will have a change of heart. And one thing I do, one thing I pray for, is I always pray that the Lord would give them mercy, that he would show them mercy. That's what I always pray for, Lord, Give them mercy. Show them mercy. And so verses 10 and 11, it, it, it's like there's this big transition within verse 1, where we, or chapter 1, excuse me, and we just hear Hosea, <coughs> his command from the Lord, but we also see the condition of the people. And then the Lord says in verses 10 and 11 into chapter 2 and verse 1 that I will not allow my people to remain in that condition. That there is an end to their idolatry because God himself will put an end to it. And he has to. Some would say, why would God intervene why doesn't he just let them ruin themselves? And, and you know what? At the end of the day, they ruin themselves, and that's it. He could start all over with someone else. I mean, that's our common way of thinking. To be truthful with you, that's kind of how we think. But remember that in verse 10, when he says, yet, remember? You see yet, I see grace. We said that to one another. You guys have already forgotten, huh? Need I remind you? Let's say it again. I see yet, or excuse me, you see yet, I see grace. And that's what we see. Just with that one word, yet, is really the grace of God. Because now the Lord is saying, I will not leave you this way. Notice what he said, the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of... Why is this important? It's important because God made a covenant. God made a promise. Listen, we need to understand what covenant theology is. He's a God of covenants. There's a theology, there's a teaching behind God's covenants. We'll work our way through this as we go through this book. But in, in short, let me just kind of give it to you this way. God makes a covenant. It is a binding contract, a contract of love, of grace, and of mercy. And God will always keep his part. But with that covenant, God also gives the pros and cons, if you will. Not because a covenant of God is a bad thing. It's that if you violate the covenant, some bad things might happen. Not that God is like, you better stay within it or I'm going to get you. It has nothing to do with God getting you. It has everything to do with the consequences of bad choices. Can we understand this morning, please, that God is not seated on the throne with a lightning bolt in his hand, ready to strike you down because all of a sudden you had an impure thought 
or you said something bad to someone or you. Now, listen, though, those things are not good and never excusable. Those things reveal to you and I our need for God more in our life. Religion will tell you you got enough and all you need is just enough to make it in. Relationship tells you God in his infinite love and in his grace and his mercy gave everything he had for you. The least you can do is give him all of you and not part of you. And then what we see is we see now our life is dictated not because we're wondering, wow, is, is he going to strike me now? Is this when I'm going to get struck, Lord? No. We live our life in a way, listen, guys, that demonstrates our gratitude that a holy God, a holy God will look upon unholy people and say, I want fellowship with you. Our relationship should always be based upon God's love toward us, not our works towards him or how much or how far. But God is the keeper of covenants. And I love that about the Lord. If he keeps covenants and doesn't break them, now, now, we might step out of the boundaries of that covenant, and guess what? We're going to have to kind of deal with what comes with stepping out of that, right? Does that mean that God is done with us? No. Even in our stepping out of that covenant, he pursues us. Why? Because he keeps his covenant. Let, let, let me say this just a little bit of what I'm really trying to explain. Even when you make bad decisions, God's blessing is still upon your life. Do you know that even when you make a wrong decision, God will still bless it because you're his son and you're his daughter. But what you lose is not fellowship with God. But perhaps the reward of obedience to the Lord, yes, it might have been a bad decision and a bad move on your part, and you probably thought you heard from the Lord. God will still bless that bad decision and that bad move because you're a child of God, but you could be potentially missing out on the reward of waiting patiently for the Lord to do what he does best and let him keep the covenant that he made with you. I love that about God, don't you? So this is why, because he's the keeper of covenants, okay? Now, then all this stuff transitions. Because God keeps his covenant, what is he going to do? Even though they strayed far, what did he say? In the place where it was said that they, are, that they are not my people, it will be said, you are my sons and my... Only God can do that. Only God can do that. What is he promising here? I will restore you. The day will come when your captivity... The day will come when this judgment will cease and I will restore. Why? Because he made a covenant to Abraham. And God had promised through his people that all the nations of the earth would be blessed. But, but you know, sometimes when we know these things, like some people say, well, you know, if God already knows the beginning and the end, and he already knows what's going to happen in my life, then you know what? I'm just going to live my life the way that I want to live. Do you realize that there is so much loss? and pain, and sorrow, and heartache that will come upon you? Do you realize the depravity of man is nothing that you and I want to live in? There is no good in us apart from the Lord. There is nothing. Don't believe the lie that the grass is greener on the other side. The other side is spelled out in one word, and that one word is loss. You will lose. And are you willing to forfeit? Are you willing to give it up? See, this has been man's problem since the very beginning. Think about this. Adam forfeited what God gave him in the Garden of Eden, did he not? Yes, he did. And God sent his son to redeem what Adam forfeited, Christ Jesus redeemed. Pretty remarkable at the price that God will pay 
Let me say this again. Boy, I hope you get this. It's amazing the price God will pay for your mistake. Man, that's a good word. The price he'll pay for your mistake and my mistake is mind-blowing. When a person makes a mistake, I always say, well, that's on you, man. God doesn't talk like us, doesn't think like us, doesn't act like us. He is nothing like us. And God paid the price for every mistake you and I would ever make. Then the children of Judah shall be the children of Israel. They shall be gathered together and appoint for themselves one head. And they shall come up from out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. And notice how it says Jezreel will be great. Remember that Jezreel not only means God scatters and he would scatter them, but it also means a place of sowing. God will sow and he will mend and he will restore and great fruit will be produced out of this great loss. You know, God can produce fruit out of loss. Did you know that? He can make fruit. God can make, listen, God can make oasis. In a barren place. In the book of the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 35. I shared this not too long ago here. But the Bible says that. The land. An arid and dry place. That, that though the ground is parched it says. The illusion of water is there. We know that it's a mirage, but, but God calls us to the wilderness to replace a mirage with an oasis. God's called us to be in a dry and barren place, but not as a mirage, as an illusion that everything is good, and when you get closer, it's just as dry and arid as everything that's around you. It's like the allure is drawing you to a mirage. And you're hoping that when you get there, it's there. You see the palm trees. You see the water. You, you kind of see what the sun does, right? In the heat. And it's kind of reflected. It's like there has to be water there. And you continue to go. And the mirage continues to go further. and It's never there. That's the way one would live their life. But the Lord is saying, I've called you to replace the mirage with an oasis. If you proclaim the fountain of living water in a dry place, you will proclaim the word of God and you will become an oasis in the desert. He says, great will be the day, prosperity, fruit will come forth. Say to your brethren, my people, and to your sisters, mercy is shown. Notice that he says no mercy. Now he's saying mercy is shown. You see, what we have here is this restoration clearly shows the faithfulness of the Lord God as the keeper of covenants. The covenant he made with Abraham, remember that? And how about the covenant he made with David? That there would always be a descendant of his to the throne. God could not utterly, utterly destroy and take his people because then he would have to forsake the covenant that he made with Abraham and the covenant he made with David. So a renewal of the people. Moses spoke about this in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 1. Jot it down. Deuteronomy 30 verse 1. He spoke about this. Their repentance would result in a renewal of the Lord's compassion. In Deuteronomy chapter 30 in verses 2 and 3. There's a reminder to God's people. And the Bible also says that they would return to the land in Deuteronomy chapter 30 in verses 4 through 9. There's just a breakdown of the first nine verses of Deuteronomy 30. Then Paul reiterated this in the book of Romans chapter 11 in verses 25 through 32. So the whole point that's being made here, guys, just in the start of chapter 2, as it says, say to your brethren, my people, and to your sisters, mercy is shown, is that God will restore his people. And we know that the ultimate restoration of God's people was not when the people came back into the land from their captivity, but the full restoration of God's people is still to take place even today. Christ at his second coming. 
establishing his kingdom in Jerusalem will be the ultimate fulfillment of God gathering all his people back into the land. Isn't that amazing? Look at verse 2. Now this is where we see the unfaithfulness of God's people, okay? This is still setting the stage for the story of the life of Hosea and his wife Gomer that will be lived out as a similitude to the people of Israel, uh, to God's relationship with the people of Israel. So verse 2 kind of is a start, and so you could say here is the description of Israel's unfaithfulness, okay? God's unfaithful people, Israel. So what do we have in view here? If you're taking notes, jot it down. Spiritual idolatry of Israel. The spiritual idolatry of Israel. So there's a charge that came. And this charge is coming in a time of great idolatry in the northern kingdom. We have an idea and a picture of what the day is like. Because remember, as we kind of just considered some passages last week, I will just read a little bit to you this week. Let's look at the day in which Jeroboam II was king. The Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 14 and verse 23, it says, In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria and reigned 41 years. Guys, this is the longest reign of a king in the northern kingdom. Jeroboam the second, he was the king. This is the king that was present when Hosea was prophesying and God gave him this word, okay? But listen to some of the things that is being said. So now we know the condition of the nation. Now let's look at the condition of the king. And he, talking about Jeroboam the second, did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart. Listen to this. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Notice there's two Jeroboams being spoken about here. Well, this king in Hosea's day is Jeroboam the second. It brings up to us Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, not the son of Joash. The king that's in view here in chapter 14 is the son of Joash. He is the last king that would be ruling in the northern kingdom before really their captivity of prominence because his reign was so long. There would be other kings that were known, but they wouldn't rule as long as him. And remember that Hoshea, Hoshea, almost the same name as Hosea, Hoshea was the final king when Assyria took the northern kingdom captive. But who is this Jeroboam? It says that this Jeroboam here, the son of Joash, did not, notice that it says, did not depart from the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Who is Jeroboam, the son of Nebat? It's Jeroboam the first. The writer of 2 Kings chapter 14 is taking you all the way back to the very start of the northern kingdom's rebellion. He's taking you back in history and saying nothing has changed. Here's what's interesting. He goes on to say here, he did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin. What was his way of making Israel sin? He built altars in the northern kingdom and made golden cal made calves of of gold and silver. Remember that. And he said, this is your God that's brought you out of the land of Egypt. And from that day, the people in the northern kingdom worshiped these idols in Bethel and in Dan. Remember that? And he's saying, well, this Jeroboam, years later, didn't depart from those ways. He continued the same thing. Here's what's interesting. I say that because listen to what the rest of the verses are going to say. This is mind-blowing. He restored the territory of Israel from the entrance of Hamath, to the sea of, of the Arabah, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he had spoken through his servant Jonah. This is Jonah, the prophet, the same prophet that is written about in the book of Jonah. The son of Amittai, the prophet who was from gath Hefer. So the Lord sent his word by this prophet Jonah, and we see that Jonah had given a word that the land would recoup a certain amount of land. Okay, so this was fulfilled with Jeroboam the second. 
For the Lord saw the affliction of Israel was very bitter, and whether bond or free, there was no helper for Israel. You know what this is saying? That God blessed Israel, the northern kingdom, even in their idolatry, and God allowed Jeroboam II to experience prosperity and to experience a time of, of success because he says here that there was no helper for Israel. Even though they had been given over and even though he did not depart from the ways of Jeroboam I, a couple of things, observation, jot it down, guys. In verse 26, we see two things. Israel was afflicted. And two, there was no help in Israel. They were afflicted and there was no help. So this reveals the situation that Israel was in. And then the verse 27 goes on to say, And the Lord did not say that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, but he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. Notice that. He, he helped them. He blessed them even in their disobedience. Isn't that like something that is just so far off? That God still worked on their behalf even when they forsook the Lord. Now listen, guys, this is not what the Bible would call in the New Testament licentiousness. You guys have ever heard that word? Okay, and you've read it in the, in the New King James or King James, licentiousness. And, and, and some of those words sometimes are hard to pronounce. But what does the word mean? It's simple. License. That's it. License. What is the sin of licentiousness? When you think it's okay to do what you want, you become your God. When you think that, oh, I can go and I can do this and, and God will forgive me, trust me. Just because nothing has happened right then and there, don't think that nothing will come of it after. It's coming. Believe that. God judges all sin. A true child of God, as Spurgeon says, God does not let his children sin successfully. So be ready for the consequence to your sin. But notice something. Licentiousness doesn't mean that you can go and just do it however you want. That is rebellion in and of itself. It's a heart of idolatry also. In a sense, we kind of look at this and some would say, well, God's still blessing me, so what difference does it make? Oh, it makes a lot of difference. During Jeroboam's reign, the people rested in the prosperity. In the prosperity of Jeroboam, not in the Lord. They did not or could not see that the blessings truly came from the Lord. They thought the blessings came from Jeroboam. They thought the blessings came from the false gods that they worshipped. They were warned, not only by Hosea, they were also warned by the prophet Amos, and that judgment was coming. That judgment did come in 722 B.C. The rich were getting richer at the expense of the poor. That's what Amos and Hosea will say. And then we also see that as the rich were getting richer, what they were doing is that the elders and the leaders were practicing their religion and sacrifices, but it wasn't unto the Lord. It was unto the idols in the land. The wealthy lived in luxury while the poor suffered. They looked to the day of the Lord, but they didn't realize that the day of the Lord was a day of judgment. Pretty interesting how sometimes we think we know God. They were still given to idolatry, which ultimately leads and will continue to lead to moral decay. They oppress the poor and misuse their power and luxury which was condemned by the Lord and would ultimately be judged by him. Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam and all that he did, his might, how he made war and how he recaptured for Israel from Damascus and Kamath, what had belonged to Judah. 
Are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Jeroboam rested with his fathers, the king of Israel. Then Zechariah, his son, reigned in his place. So notice just these verses here in 2 Kings. It's saying that the Lord brought blessings to Jeroboam. It wasn't Jeroboam's own work. It was God's doing, even in the midst of their idolatry. I think, to me, I think that has a lot to do now when we understand what is being said now in chapter 2 of Hosea has now better understanding for us to really consider what the Lord is doing. Just think about this, because all this is building up to something. You know, the common question that is asked and will be asked of you, if you're truly living out your faith and you come across a person who is truly searching and seeking, they're going to say, you say that your God is a God of love, then why did he do this, this, and that? This is why you need to understand this. What ends up happening is most people don't understand. They think that the God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New Testament. It's the same God. And this is what his word is for, that so that we could understand his heart and his person so that it can transform us and, and change us. Will we ever fully understand God? No, not on this side of heaven. Nor will we ever become like him in knowledge. He is God. But I want to know, there are things that I have scratched my head and cannot wrap my mental capacity around, and that is God's love for me, even when I know the truth and the reality of my heart. We play Christianity good on the outside. God knows us to what we are on the inside. And I'm not calling anybody in here a hypocrite. But it seems that we are better hypocrites than sons and daughters because what is practiced and lived out outwardly, no way in any way is consistent with what God sees inwardly. What I want is what's in here to be brought out, to be dealt with, so that there is great consistency in my life. I find life to be very confusing when I live outwardly different than what my heart truly believes and embraces inwardly. Christianity becomes convoluted. You feel like you're spinning your wheels and, and you get this weird idea that the more you do for God, the more he's going to bless you. A lie. God blesses you simply because he loves you. You just read the scriptures right now that God was blessing the northern kingdom even though their king was in flat out blatant sin and the people still misinterpreted what the blessings were rather than saying the blessings are coming from God because in their minds they probably figured they deserve no blessing. That's the wrong view of God. Do you guys understand that this is what Jesus was talking about in the parable of the talents? Do you understand that? When they were given a talent, right? And the two servants doubled their talents. Remember that? But the other guy kind of buried it. And he says, I know you to be a harsh master. Reaping where you did not sow. And he begins to say, I know what you're about. And I know what you are. And so rather than risk losing the talent, I just put it away because you want to know what? I'd rather save it because I really know what you are. And you want to know what? That statement in and of itself truly showed he didn't know his master. And then the master says to him, knowing then that I was harsh, knowing then that I reap where I have not sown. He wasn't saying that that's true about him. What he's using is your preconceived thoughts of me will be your judgment. God gave the servant talents. Blessings are bestowed upon us, guys. I, I'm trying to drive a point home here, and I didn't know this morning how I was going to do it, but I think the Lord's building something really good in this study. God had given Israel everything they needed, listen to this, to repent and turn to the Lord. It's interesting when people say, I'm good. Are you really good? Well, look at wife's happy. 
Kids are clean, hair's combed. I'm in church, ain't I? I'm blessed. What determines our blessings? It's a good question to ask yourself. In no way am I pointing the direction to you, but I am pointing the direction to the idols of our heart. All of us have idols in our heart. Whether you agree with it or not, remember not too long ago we read about the idols of the heart. The truth of the matter is this. The people of Israel had not only idols that were physical and they were there and they would bow to them and they would worship them. Their idolatry was evident, but they also had idols of the heart. If you remove the physical idols in the land, they would still bow down to the idols in their heart. They were so lost and confused and blind, and yet they were still God's people. Now this begins to build a picture for us and build a foundation that you and I can, to a degree, if even for a little bit, just relate. Amen? And say, wow. Your love is amazing, Lord. It's interesting how Satan so desires to shape our theology. And he wants to give you an understanding of God that never comes from his word and his character. God is holy. Do you guys see that this is kind of the premise of what is taking place here just in these first couple of verses, that God is holy? Not only is he good and is he loving, but God is holy. So here's the whole basis of all of this, guys. Listen. The charge now is coming against them. We looked at what was taking place, right? We just read it. Now look at verse 2. Bring charges against your mother. Bring charges, for she is not my wife, nor am I her husband. Your mother? Meaning what? Well, Israel as a whole. Who are the children that are supposed to bring a charge against their mother? The individual Israelites, the individuals within the nation. The nation as a whole is the mother. The father or the husband is God. The setting when it uses the word bring a charge, it's a summon to bring a charge like in a courtroom. The Lord is the plaintiff. Israel is the defendant. Charges now are being brought against them, and they now have to give an account. And this is the setting here. When it says bring a charge, the idea is very clear. For she is not my wife. This doesn't mean divorce. It couldn't mean that because God would never divorce himself from his people Israel. God here is showing us that a relationship is broken. She's not my wife. Not because God divorced her. She's not his wife because she forsook the covenant of the Lord and she renounced it. And God is saying, she's not my wife because of her actions and her doing because the wife of the Lord would never carry on this way. So she's not my wife. And then we look here and we see, rather than exercise the legal process, right, of adultery, which would be Leviticus in chapter 20 and verse 10, would be what? What's the legal process for adultery? Stoning by death. So what would he do? He would remove them. Rather than go through the legal process... Rather than do that, he wants to give opportunity and room for her to repent. Rather than go through the legal process, listen to this, guys, the Lord calls for repentance. Isn't that so amazing? Israel lewdly offered herself 
to other gods. Look at the picture here. It's so amazing. He says, let her put away her harlotries from her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. This was a way in which a temple prostitute would expose herself to, to uh, seduce by her nakedness. This was an actual practice. The point that the Lord was saying is, Israel has exposed herself this way and has enticed because she is pursuing, she's going after the worship of these idols, just like the temple prostitutes would do to these false gods. As the men would come to offer up their sacrifice, these women would come out with their, exposing their nakedness to allure them, to, to draw them in married men, and that they would partake in this act of sinfulness. And in the same way that this would happen outside these false gods' temples with these temple prostitutes, Israel did the same spiritually as they exposed themselves. They, that, that which should only be revealed unto the Lord was now given to other gods. He says in verse 3, put away... In verse 2, in verse 3, he says, Lest I strip her nakedness and expose her as in the day she was born. In other words, expose her. Allow there to be shame. Put away her harlot-like ways, or she will be judged. Lest I strip her naked and expose her as in the day she was born and make her like a wilderness. Remember, guys, the wilderness is a dry and arid place, right? What does that mean, making her like a wilderness? This is what will happen, incapable of producing or sustaining life. Israel could become a people that could one day just be gone. And their whole purpose was so that they could win other nations to the Lord, right? If you were to relate that today in our relationship with the Lord, all of us have a relationship with God. The church doesn't replace Israel. God's still going to fulfill what he promises his people Israel. That day is going to come at Christ's second coming. How does this relate to you and I today? We see the severity, right? We see the reality, and God did judge the sin of his people. But the same applies to us today. When we give ourselves to someone or something other than the Lord God, we expose ourselves. That which was committed unto the Lord. I mean, think about a husband and a wife's relationship. When you're married, there's a covenant that you make to one another before the Lord. And your nakedness should never be exposed to anyone else. The moment that that's done, what was given to the eyes of your spouse for the eyes of your spouse and them alone, once it's revealed to someone else, you've broken that covenant. And even though God will forgive you at the end of the day, you've exposed it to someone else. The pain, the heartache that some go through because of this type of sin that is lived out physically. Here, it's in the context spiritually, but also in the same way. This is why I think sometimes people try to separate marriage or family or home with the relationship with God. Let me tell you something. When a person walks away from the faith, especially in the body of Christ, and you've come to know people in the body, listen, it is a painful thing to see someone say, I want nothing to do with the Lord, and they walk away. Very painful. And there's nothing you can do but pray. You can plead, you can say, don't do this. But something in them is driving them. They have no desire to receive from the Lord what he has for them. God forces himself upon no one. Think about what 
this can do in a marriage, the devastation. If you think for a moment it doesn't do this for the body of Christ, then you're not a son or daughter of the God of Scripture. It's the same thing. Same thing. He says, put away her harlot-like ways. or She will be judged. She'll be exposed. She'll be like a, a, an arid wilderness. Incapable of producing or sustaining life. And incapable of producing life. I want to be a producer of life. I want to give. You forfeit that and set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst. Verse 4 says, I will not have mercy on her children. Why? Covered by her shame, by their association with her. Because there are some, remember the, the charge is saying, you children speak against your mother. Well, guess what? There were some that would not speak against the nation because they were okay with the direction that the nation was going. And those ones that are okay with that will also be judged with the nation as a whole. But there's always a remnant. This would imply that there would be, not everybody was going in the same direction. You can kind of see that here in the context. God always has a remnant. For they are the children of harlotry, and for their mother has played the harlot. She who conceived them has behaved shamefully, for she said, I will go after my lovers. Remember, guys, what I said. This is not just somebody saying, hey, I just want to go try that. No, it doesn't work like that. Something's happened inwardly. The heart of the nation as a whole was turning from the Lord. And guys, listen, the term here, I will go, is a strong desire to depart and go after sin. In its strongest sense. To depart and go after sin. The sin of idolatry. That's the sin that's in view here. This is the sin that's being judged. The sin of idolatry. Go after my lovers while these various idols. And look at what they would declare. Who gave me my bread and my water, my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink. You mean to tell me that you really believe these false gods that you pursued with all your heart and these idolatries that you took up after, that they're the ones that blessed you with all this? We just read that in the days of Jeroboam, God blessed them because there was no one there to take care of Israel. But rather than see that the blessings truly come from the Lord, they took the blessings of God and used them for something other than the worship and gratitude to God. Israel believed that these gods gave them their sustenance and their means to live. Isn't it interesting how quickly the enemy can just deceive your mind and make you think you're okay? Look at all the stuff you couldn't do when you were following, you know, Jesus. But look at all the stuff you can do now, right? I mean, anything your eyes want, you can have it. It's all good, man. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if anybody has ever lived their life to the fullest in the world, I did. I'm not talking about, you know, as a kid going to ditching parties and drinking here and getting drunk a couple of times. I'm talking about being not knee deep, nose deep in your sin. And everything goes. And you really think that life's good. You know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that life is horrible. You start to think, is this it? Is this all there is to, am I going to be doing this the rest of my life? I mean, think about it. 50, 60 years old, kicking it with, uh, you know, <laughs> kids. Doesn't look cool, man. <laughs> trying to recapture your youth, you know, try, trying to look cool and young, you know. It, it just blows me away, the way of the world. And, and this is it. This is where fulfillment is. This is where, this is where it's at. No, it's not there. It's in Christ. I have yet in 18 years to come to a point in my Christian faith to say, I'm not happy with the Lord. 
There's always a sense of joy. As I read this, my heart is so stirred and challenged. And the question that I asked myself this morning as I was reading this chapter and preparing this message for the church was, Lord, have I abused what you've given me? Have I forgotten the value of your grace and your mercy? Have I become ungrateful? And I think that that's a question we should all ask ourselves. Not that you do, I'm just saying it's a, it's a good gauge to bring things back into perspective for you on a daily basis. It's not a bad thing to do, but you want to know what? The Lord might reveal something to you and point something out to you that has been detrimental to your walk that you would have never otherwise would have known if you would not have said, Lord, show me. Show me. I often quote this psalm, but I never read it to you guys, but I want to read it to you. I'm going to read it to you because I can. This is what it says here. In Psalm 139, It says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. Notice that. O Lord, you have searched me and you have known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue. Behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before and have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Oh, where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend, not that I will, but if I choose to, if I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. You formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame is not hidden from you. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I wake, I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men. For they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. That's an amazing psalm, isn't it? You should pray that every day. Psalm 139, it's like, what is he saying? He's saying, check my thoughts and my motives. You know the words that are going to come out of my mouth before they even come out of my mouth. The heart check here for the people. He says, I will not have mercy on their children. We need to check our heart and see, Lord, 
Have we misdirected and misguided our appreciation? Therefore, he says in verse 6, I will hedge up your way with thorns and will wall her in so that she cannot find her paths. She will see, uh, chase her lovers, but not overtake them. Yes, she will seek them, but not find them. Then she will say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then it was better for me than now. You know what verses 6, 7 are saying? The Lord's saying, listen, You've now had your time of experiencing supposedly your blessings from your false gods. I'm going to make it now difficult for you. It's not going to be as easy to receive the blessing. It's not going to be as easy for you to go to these false gods. I'm doing this because I am hedging your way with thorns. It's going to be difficult. Listen, God will make it difficult because his children cannot sin successfully. The Lord will use the difficulties to bring her back. Guess what? You go, you're going to realize how difficult it is and how bad you really had it when you were away from the Lord. Isn't it crazy how sometimes people serve the Lord for a little while and then they start to think, maybe, maybe I'm going to go back to the old places, the old people, and hang around. You know, I'm a little bit more mature now. And guess what? You're taken by it. And you want to know what? You return back to the beggarly elements that God brought you from, as Peter and the Proverbs say, like a dog returning to his own vomit. And then you realize, then you realize it was better back with the Lord. It's like the story of the prodigal son. It's the same picture here, guys. Nothing is changing. It's just Israel, and it's the Lord God. God will not allow. He will not allow us to enjoy the gift while rejecting the gift giver. He will not allow it. So he will bring us back. He will bring them back. And listen to this, guys. God gave them rain, and they thanked the false gods. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, jot it down, please. Deuteronomy 8, verses 17 through 18. The Bible clearly teaches that it's God and God alone who is the gift giver. God blesses the people. Know that your, that your blessings and the goodnesses come from the Lord. This is one thing the world doesn't even realize, that even the wealthy in the world, those are gifts are from the Lord. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 16, jot it down, or 17, excuse me. For she did not know that I gave her grain, new wine and oil, thinking, guys, listen, thinking because it was of her own doing. In her idolatry, God still blessed her because of his love for her. And she thought, Israel thought, they, they thought that this came from the false gods of the land. But God says, I gave her her grain, her new wine, her oil, multiplied her silver and her gold. Listen to this, which they prepared for Baal or Baal. Everything that God gave them, let me say this again, listen, all the blessings and the goodnesses and the gifts that God gave them, they used it to worship their idols. The words, or those words of thanksgiving to the Lord God of Israel, now said to the false gods, in Deuteronomy 26 and verse 10, remember what the Lord says, when you come to me with all that I've given you, he says, these will the words that you will say to me. I bring the first fruits of the soil that you, O Lord, have given me. Those words are not being said to God, but they're being said to Baal. The sun God of heaven. They believe that their rain that produced this fruitful harvest and season, that they're able to get all their wool and their, and their food and their grain from, all this has come from this rain that enriched the land. They thought it came from the worship of Baal, but the Lord is saying, no, it came from me. And all the silver and gold that they prospered in, they used it to worship Baal. Do you know that you can take the very things that God has blessed you with and use them for wrong worship and wrong glory? I remember years ago I said this, we take the blessings of God and they become a curse to us. Instead, it was used to make false gods. The Lord gave Israel her produce and her wealth, her worth. The worship of Baal had been worshipped even before the days of Ahab and Jezebel. Judges chapter 2, verse 17. 
Judges 3 and verse 3. And Judges chapter 8 and verse 32. When was the worship of Baal established in Israel? Well, we know that in 1 Kings in chapters 18 and 19, by the marriage of Ahab to Jezebel, this worship influenced, and guess what? The people began to worship this God. Therefore, I will return and take away my grain in its time and my new wine in its season and will take back my wool and my linen, give to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall deliver her from my hand. I will also cause all of her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, her sabbaths, all her appointed feasts, and I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, of which she has said, These are my wages that my lovers have given me. So I will make them a forest, and the beast of the field shall eat them. I I will punish her for the days of the Baals to which she burned incense. She decked herself with her earrings and jewelry and went after her lovers. But me she forgot, says the Lord. They took all of this, guys, as we close this morning. Listen to this. Obedience to the Lord brought about great blessing. Jot it down. Leviticus 26, verses 3 through 13. In Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 through 14. Obedience to the Lord brought about blessing. Disobedience to the Lord would bring a curse. Leviticus 26, verses 14 through 29. And Leviticus 28, verses 15 through 68. Same book and same chapter. The blessings and the cursings. Obedience brought prosperity. Disobedience brought great loss. Listen, guys. As we close this morning, we see here that, yes, God now is revealing to them the true motives and intent of their heart. And if we leave on this note, we say, wow, Lord, have I forsaken what you've given me? Listen, God just doesn't leave us hanging. The rest of the chapter reveals God's mercy and how his desire is to restore us back and bring us back, Israel, back to the place of worship before the Lord. God just doesn't leave his people high and dry. But before you can understand God's amazing love and before you can appreciate his mercy and his restoration, you first need to understand the heart of man. And one needs to truly understand the depravity of their own selves. Like Israel, this whole time they thought... It was the false gods in the land. Well, all the while the Lord was saying, no, I was there all along, even in your disobedience. But now the day is going to come where your consequences will bring to end your idolatry. God is so good to us. Amen? Amen. He's so good to us. And you know what's more amazing about this? Ask yourself this question today. Have you misdirected your appreciation? Have you misdirected your thankfulness with your resources, with your job, with your gift, with your talents, what God has given you in the ministry? It's funny, people get a job, they're so thankful for it, and then somewhere down the line they begin to complain about it. I thought God blessed you with that job. God's not bipolar The blessings are going to come whether it's good or it's bad. If your resources, you know, God bless me because your bank account's doing good. But then when there's like, you know what, insufficient funds, you're like, you know, God's not blessing me right now. No, he's still blessing you because he's God. Possessions are not wrong to have, but when your possessions possess you, they no longer have come from the Lord God. You've made them your God. You've took the blessings of the Lord and made them a curse to you. I'm not saying any of us here are guilty of that, but perhaps this can be a revelation to you and I. Boy, Israel was in a bad place. Yes, we all agree. We're in a good place by God's grace because of what Jesus did for us. But since that day that we've professed Christ, have we've taken everything that we've received, and listen to me, listen to me, have we used it for his honor and for his glory? Don't nod your head. Because you can't determine that. Ask the Lord and be ready for him to reveal to you what he's going to reveal. And when he does, say, Lord, from this day forward, 
I'm going to honor you with all that I have because it comes from you. Yeah.